హాయ్ ఎవ్రీబాడీ వెల్కమ్ టు మై యూట్యూబ్ ఛానల్ డాక్టర్ శ్రీనివాస్ మెడికల్ కాన్సెప్ట్స్ అండ్ మై ఎఫ్వి పేజ్ డాక్టర్ శ్రీనివాస్ కాన్సెప్ట్స్ దిస్ ఇస్ డాక్టర్ శ్రీనివాస్ న్యూరాలజిస్ట్ ఫ్రమ్ రాజమండ్రి ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ ఇండియా ఐ ఎమ్ ఆల్సో ది మెడికల్ ఆథర్ ఆఫ్ ద బుక్ ఫోకస్డ్ న్యూరాలజీ మై ఈమెయిల్ అడ్రస్ ఇస్ శ్రీ కేఎల్పిఎం అట్ జీమెయిల్ డాట్ కామ్ టుడే వీ హెవ్ టాక్ అబౌట్ అ వెరీ వెరీ ఇంట్రెస్టింగ్ టాపిక్ spinal cord disorders and paraplegia part 2 differential diagnosis and evaluation so differential diagnosis and evaluation the diagnostic approach spinal cord disorders could be either acute or chronic acute spinal cord disorders may be further classified as compressive and non compressive myelopathies so what are compressive and non compressive myelopathies the first priority is to exclude treatable compression of the cord by a mass lesion epidural compression due to malignancy or abscess often causes warning signs of neck or back pain bladder disturbances and sensory symptoms that precede the actual development of paralysis they are usually picked up by mri whereas non compressive lesions usually produced myelopathy without antecedent symptoms so acute spinal cord diseases symptoms of cord disease that evolve over days or weeks are focal neck or back pain followed by various combinations of paresthesias sensory loss motor weakness and sphincter disturbances when paresthesias begin in the feet and then ascend a polyneuropathy is often considered and in such cases the presence of bladder disturbances and a sharply demarcated spinal cord level provide important clues to the spinal cord origin of the diseases so acute spinal cord diseases it could be compressive myelopathies or non compressive myelopathies compressive myelopathies are myelo are myelopathies which are because of compression compression of the spinal cord non compressive myelopathies are the myelopathies without any compression like it could be infarction or immune mediated compressors are actually a focal pathology like a, a neoplasm or abscess so compressive myelopathies basically there are four types neoplastic spinal cord compression spinal epidural abscess spinal epidural hematoma and acute disc herniation whereas non compressive myelopathies it could be because of spinal cord infarction immune mediated myelopathies and infectious myelopathies neoplastic spinal cord compression most are epidural in origin resulting from metastasis to the adjacent spinal bones breast lung prostate are the most frequent thoracic cord is most commonly involved Initial, initial symptom is usually back pain worst when recumbent with local tenderness preceding other symptoms by many weeks spinal cord compression due to metastasis is a medical emergency in general therapy will not reverse paralysis if more than 48 hours of duration spinal epidural abscess triad of fever localized midline dorsal spinal or neck pain and progressive limb weakness once neurologic signs appear cord compression rapidly progresses the other uh, disease is the spinal epidural hematoma it presents as a acute focal or radicular pain followed by variable signs of spinal cord or corners medullaris disorders acute disc herniation cervical and uh, lumbar disc herniations are more common than thoracic disc herniations we when we see a person having disc herniation it could be usually due to either cervical or lumbar but not thoracic what are the reasons because there is excessive mobility at the neck cervical and back lumbar than thoracic regions there are excessive degenerative changes because of excessive mobility and therefore disc prolapse is more common in cervical and lumbar level we keep moving neck on, on all directions we keep moving our back in in different directions but we hardly move thorax perhaps for breathing because of this excessive mobility at the neck and the lumbar region there are excessive degenerative changes occurring in the cervical and lumbar spine 
and because of that cervical disc prolapse and lumbar disc prolapse are more common than thoracic disc prolapse second the thorax is well protected by rib cage because of this good protection by rib cage the thoracic disc prolapse is unusual right now let's see the non compressive myelopathies spinal cord infarction anterior spinal artery infarction produces paraplegia or quadriplegia sensory loss affection pain and temperature but sparing vibration and position sense because they are supplied by posterior spinal arteries and the loss of sphincter control onset is sudden or progressive evolving in minutes or a few hours immune mediated myelopathies demyelinating diseases especially multiple sclerosis or neuromyelitis optica can present as acute transverse myelopathy glucocorticoids consisting of iv methylprednisolone followed by oral prednisolone are indicated for moderate to severe symptoms connective tissue diseases like sle systemic lupus erythematosus or aps antiphospholipid syndrome and sarcoid can produce acute transverse myelopathy the other causes of acute transverse myelopathy are idiopathic infectious myelopathies herpes zoster is the most common viral agent others being hsv1 and 2 antivirals may be appropriately started pending laboratory confirmation west nile virus can cause a polio like syndrome tuberculosis is very common in some countries like india cystosomiosis is an important cause worldwide so now having seen uh, important categories of compressive myelopathy and important categories of non compressive myelopathy in acute spinal cord disorders now let's summarize the important features differentiating compressive myelopathy and non compressive myelopathy compressive myelopathy amenable to treatment yes it is amenable to treatment it could be abscess disc prolapse or neoplasm which can be surgically removed non compressive myelopathy usually they are not amenable to treatment for example if it is a uh, transverse myelitis we give uh, steroids uh, but not really of great value as compared to compressive myelopathy where we can actually surgically intervene and remove the pathology antecedent symptoms antecedent symptoms like neck pain bladder disturbances are common in compressive myelopathy it is because of compression like abscess or tumor or disc prolapse so it takes long time it starts becoming bigger 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 and slowly compressing myelopathy and slowly compressing spinal cord causing myelopathy so there will be antecedent symptoms like neck pain or bladder disturbances which are present in compressive myelopathy whereas in non compressive myelopathy there are no antecedent symptoms because there is no compression like like immune mediated or infections or uh, infarction there are no antecedent symptoms they present suddenly the causes of compressive myelopathy are malignancy abscess hematoma herniated disc pathology the causes for non compressive myelopathy are vascular inflammatory and infectious mri brain so since it's a compressive pathology there should be a focal uh, compressive cause so mri scan is usually abnormal in compressive myelopathy whereas in non compressive myelopathy there is not much compression so mri is usually normal in non compressive myelopathy so these are the important differences between compressive myelopathy and non compressive myelopathy right having seen acute spinal cord disorders now let's focus our attention attention to the chronic spinal cord disorders spondylotic myelopathy it is one of the most common causes of chronic cord compression and of gait difficulty in the elderly presence as neck and shoulder pain with stiffness radicular arm pain and progressive spastic para paresis with paresthesias and loss of vibration sense so basically it is like a radiculomyelopathy we have lehermet sign lehermet sign is because of the involvement of the posterior column especially at the level of the cervical cord either it is because of cervical spondylosis in elderly or multiple sclerosis in young patients so lehermet sign is a short intense sensation that feels similar to an electric shock passing down the neck and the spine and radiating through the trunk and limbs a tendon reflex is in the arms is often diminished at some level and urinary incontinence may occur in advanced cases diagnosis is by mri and treatment is surgical vascular malformations an important treatable cause of progressive or episodic myelopathy is vascular malformation uh, 
may occur at any level. Diagnosis is often suggested by contrast enhanced MRI but is confirmed by selective spinal angiography. Treatment generally consists of microsurgical resection, endovascular embolization of the major feeding vessels or a combination of the two approaches. Retrovirus associated myelopathies. Infection with human T cell lymphotriophic virus HTLV1 may produce a slowly progressive spastic paraparesis with variable pain, sensory loss and bladder disturbance. Diagnosis is made by demonstration of specific serum antibody and treatment is symptomatic. A progressive vacuolar myelopathy may also result from HIV infection. Syringomyelia a cavitary expansion of the spinal cord resulting in progressive myelopathy may be an isolated finding or associated with protrusion of cerebellar tonsils into cervical spinal canal, what we call it as Chiari type 1. Dissociated sensory loss very characteristic of syringomyelia. The classic presentation is loss of pain and temperature sensations due to crossing spinothalamic tract involvement, but sparing of touch and pressure and vibration sense due to intact posterior column which do not cross at the level of the spinal cord but cross at the level of the medulla oblongata. So when there is a cavity in the center of the spinal cord, it affects the traversing spinothalamic tract fibers but spares posterior column. So it results in dissociated sensory loss. The pain and temperature carried by spinothalamic tract is affected whereas the touch position vibration joint sense carried by posterior column is spared. This is known as dissociated sensory loss, very characteristic of syringomyelia. They may not, uh, they may appreciate touch, but when they keep their hand in the fire, they may not able to appreciate the pain because they have lack of pain because of dissociated sensory loss, syringomyelia. So, there's a loss of pain and temperature sensation in the neck, shoulder, forearms or hands with areflexic weakness in the upper limbs and progressive spastic paraparesis. Next category is subacute combined degeneration of the cord which is because of vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 is very much essential for myelination and therefore when there is vitamin B12 deficiency, the myelinated tracts are particularly affected that is posterior column and pyramidal tract which are well myelinated tracts, optic nerve and cerebellum which are also well myelinated, they get affected. The spinothalamic tract which is the least myelinated of all the tracts is not affected because it is not well myelinated. Vitamin B12 usually affects the tracts which are well myelinated because vitamin B12 is responsible for myelination and therefore when there is vitamin B12 deficiency, these myelinated tracts get affected. So paresthesias in the hands and feet, early loss of vibration position sense that is the posterior column, progressive spastic or ataxic weakness, cerebellar involvement, ataxia, a reflexia due to associated peripheral neuropathy. The large fibers are well myelinated, they also can get affected and mental changes and optic atrophy because second nerve is also well myelinated may be present along with a serum macrocytic anemia. The causes include dietary deficiency especially in vegetarians and gastric malabsorption syndromes including pernicious anemia. Diagnosis is confirmed by a low serum vitamin B12 level elevated levels of homocysteine and methyl malonic acid. Treatment is vitamin replacement, B12 replacement beginning with 1 mg of IM vitamin B12 repeated at regular intervals or by subsequent oral treatment. The next category in chronic spinal cord disorders is hypocupric myelopathy. It is because of copper deficiency. Clinically nearly identical to subacute combined degeneration except there is no neuropathy. Low levels of serum copper and usually zero ceruloplasmin make the diagnosis. Excessive zinc in injection is also one of the causes of uh, hypocopper, uh, hypocupric myelopathy. Treatment is oral copper supplementation. Multiple sclerosis. Spinal cord involvement is common and is a major cause of disability, especially in progressive forms of multiple sclerosis. Tabis dorsalis, tertiary syphilis. It may present as lancinating pains, gait ataxia, bladder disturbances and visceral crisis. Argyll Robertson's pupil. Pupil failed to constrict to light but accommodated. The pupillary light pathway and accommodation light pathways are slightly different. Uh, the pupillary light reflex pathway goes through the pretectal nucleus whereas the accommodation reflex pathway may not go through the pretectal nucleus and therefore when the pretectal the nucleus gets affected like a tertiary syphilis, 
the accommodation reflex is present but pupil light reflex is absent which is known as argil robertson's pupil the other signs of a reflexia in the legs impaired position uh, are a reflex in the legs impaired position vibration sense and robux rhombus sign hereditary spastic paraplegia there's a progressive spasticity and weakness in the legs occurring on a familial basis may be autosomal dominant recessive or x linked adenomyeloneuropathy it's an x linked disorders that is a variant of adenoleukodystrophy and therefore it usually affects males usually affected males have a history of adrenal insufficiency and then develop a slowly progressive spastic paraparesis female heterozygotes may develop a slowly progressive myelopathy without adrenal insufficiency diagnosis is made by elevated very long chain fatty acids in the plasma and in the culture fibroblast allogenic bone marrow transplantation has been successful in slowing progression of the cognitive decline in ald but appears to be effective for the myelopathy nutritional supplements like lorenzo's oil has been attempted but without evidence of efficacy right now having known so many causes of the spinal cord involvement what is the diagnostic evaluation how how are we going to evaluate what are the steps this is the best simplified approach the four step approach if we go systematically with these four steps it is easy to clinch the diagnosis of paraplegia so what is the simplified the four step approach step 1 the first step when a person comes with paraplegia the first step is to perform an mri of the spine to rule out a compressive etiology which may need urgent intervention so step 1 we need to take mri step 2 once a compression is ruled out is excluded the next step is to confirm the evidence of inflammation by mri spine contrast study and csf to differentiate between inflammatory and non inflammatory etiologies as the treatment modalities are different so if it is compression excluded it could be non compressive myelopathy so it could be either because of inflammatory or non inflammatory because the treatment is completely different we need to know whether it is inflammatory or non inflammatory cause so this is a step 2 step 3 if there is evidence of inflammation the next step is to search for the cause of inflammation as it may be due to demyelination infections or secondary to systemic causes like systemic lupus erythematosus that is step 3 if there is evidence of inflammation we need to search the cause for the inflammation step 4 if there is no evidence of inflammation when no evidence of inflammation exists consider non inflammatory etiologies like vascular or nutritional like vitamin b12 deficiency metabolic or radiation or inherited so this is the simplified approach to paraplegia our diagnostic approach and work up so the neurological involvement consists with the spinal cord involvement so first we if if we suspect that there's a spinal cord involvement what are the four steps which i just mentioned uh, we have to take and clinch the diagnosis step 1 as i said we need to take mri to rule out compression so step 1 we need to take mri to rule out compression if there's a compressive lesion then it could be like neoplasm abscess or disc prolapse we subject to surgery surgical management if there's no compression then we go to the next step and when we take mri spine if there's a cord atrophy then we have to think of inherited disorders so MRI spine we take if there is compression surgical management if there is cord atrophy we consider inherited disorders but if there is no compression but we suspect a spinal cord disease we have to go to the next step the second step the second step is to find out if there is no compression whether there is any inflammation or there is no inflammation so whether there is evidence of inflammation whether there is no evidence of inflammation if there is evidence of inflammation we do gadolinium enhancement mri with gadolinium enhancement or cerebrospinal fluid analysis and we look for any inflammatory causes like immune infections and other causes so the second step is to do csf to confirm whether there is inflammation or gadolinium enhancement but if we think there is no evidence of inflammation we think of other causes like metabolic uh and other causes 
then we go to the step 3 step 3 we try to get to the get closer to the disease but by asking the associated features for example if we think it is infection we need to ask about fever and other uh, systemic conditions and then proceed with step 4 csf analysis If we think it's a systemic etiology, then we have to evaluate for systemic causes uh, by doing a ESR CRP. If it could be oral ulcer or genital ulcers, uh, then we have to go for ESR and CRP. But if we think that the it's a developmental disorders and it could be a visual involvement and other uh, conditions, then we have to do, do uh, imaging again. Imaging again, it can pick up three varieties one is multiple sclerosis second is neuromyelitis optica third is the myelin associated oligoclonal uh, oligodendroglial disorders so if it is multiple sclerosis it will only short segment involvement and there will be usually a cerebral lesion whereas if it is neuromyelitis optica a long segment involvement in the spinal cord usually more than uh, three segments involvement and obviously the optic nerve involvement will be there if it is the MOG spectrum disease, usually the conus lesions are present. So, this is a very, very simplified, easy way of approaching paraplegia. First, we do MRI to see whether compressive lesions are there or compressive lesions are not there. If there is there's no compressive lesion, we go to the step 2 by doing MRI with enhancement studies or CSF to find out whether inflammatory pathology is there or non-inflammatory pathology is there. If we think it's an inflammatory pathology is there, then we ask for associated conditions. It could be infection, then we ask for fever, or it could be systemic uh, diseases, vasculitis, so we ask for uh, genital oral ulcers history, or it could be a, or it could be a demyelination, then we think of the uh, neuromyelitis spectrum disorders. So if we think infection, we ask for CSF analysis. If we think it is a systemic involvement, then we go for ESR, CR, CRP. If we think it is because of the demyelination, then we go for imaging. Imaging shows multiple sclerosis, a short segment with cerebral involvement, neuromyelitis optica, long segment with optic nerve involvement, and MOG spectrum disorders, usually it is a conus lesions. So, having cleansed the diagnosis, there could be treatable causes and non-treatable causes. But uh, for academic purposes, yeah, we do discuss. But from the patient's point of view, what is more important is that whether there are treatable spinal cord disorders or not. So the first step after clinching the diagnosis, we should always look for the treatable spinal cord disorders because we can do so much good for the patient and the patient also uh, will be happy uh, getting re uh, recovered from the disease he's been suspecting. So he's been su uh, suspecting and suffering. So the first the approach is always look for treatable spinal cord disorders. So what are the treatable spinal cord disorders? One is compressive. It could be epidural, intradural or intramedial neoplasm which can be taken out or epidural abscess again can be taken out and can be given antibiotics, epidural hemorrhage, cervical spondylosis, herniated disc again a surgical approach, post-traumatic compression by fracture or displaced vertebra or hemorrhage. So all these compressive spinal cord disorders are treatable. Second is arteriovenous malformation and dural fistula antiphospholipid syndrome and other hypergoagulable states where we can give anticoagulants. Inflammatory, multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, transverse myelitis, sarcoidosis, systemic lupus erythematosus related myelopathy where we can give steroids. Infections, viral, varicella, zoster virus, HSV1 and 2, bacterial tuberculosis, we can give antibacterial, we can give anti tuberculosis, we can give antiviral drugs. Developmental like syringomyelia, meningomyelial, tethered cord syndrome, we can approach surgically. Metabolic subacute combined degeneration, we can supplement with vitamin B12. Copper deficiency, we can always supplement with copper. And therefore, when we approach a case of spinal cord disorder, we should always look out for treatable spinal cord disorders. Yeah, most of the concepts of uh, neurology I put in a question answer format and in, in, my, in a book written by me, S. Srinivas. The name of the book is Focus Neurology. It is available online from all the leading bookshops, including Amazon. Uh, this book can be bought online. Uh, these are the important concepts of the differential diagnosis and evaluation workup of the spinal cord disorders and paraplegia. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture as much as I have enjoyed delivering it. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel or you can email to cklpm at gmail.com. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my every page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.